Here we were discussing the myofibril, which is also called the skeletal muscle cell, and we had identified a variety of the features that we find in this particular cell. And where we left off last time was discussing the mitochondria. Uh, and, and I actually had introduced the idea of the endosymbiotic relationship. I don't know if you remember that or not, but this is the idea that at one time a very small bacteria like archaic cell entered into another cell and it wasn't consumed or destroyed and so it took up residence and for evolutionary time it's developed into what we know as the mitochondria. And the evidences that are given towards this being accurate is that, well, we have a morphology or the shape of the mitochondria is very bacteria-like. Two, the mitochondria has its own DNA, and in fact, it's in a circular pla uh, pattern called a plasmid, and that's what exactly we find inside of bacterial DNA as well. So it really looks like that this happened, and then given enough time, 4.6, well, really 3 billion years, which is the, how long life has been on this planet, there's enough time there for the evolutionary process to take hold and for us to go from having cells that don't produce their own energy on their own, they have to get it from other sources such as the sun, to generate it on their own because now they have the powerhouse inside of the cell. Well, that theory has actually been shot. And part of the reason is because of the mitochondria that we find inside of the muscle cells. And back in the 80s, we took serial sections through uh, muscle fiber. So we took basically slices of it through the length and we'd image those with electron microscope, and then we'd stack all those images on top of each other, and we could build a three-dimensional computer model of itself. And what began to be generated was this map of the mitochondria. This is the mitochondria here, kind of in this yellow color, that showed that even though in cross-section it looks very bacteria-like, in reality, when we put it into the context of a three-dimensional shape, it's actually this reticulum throughout the muscle cell. Stuffed in to fit around all of these other little proteins that are in there. So you can see here, very bacteria-like in shape, but in reality, it was this continuous network of mitochondria throughout the muscle cell packed in where it can fit. And so it doesn't really fit the morphological idea there. The other thing too is that genome that the mitochondria have we actually know now that genes can be exchanged between the nuclear genome and the mitochondrial genome. And that doesn't make any sense in the context of uh, in a cell invading another cell. Why would one cell donate its DNA in one direction and then back in the other direction as well? So, in addition to all of the other structures we've talked about, we have the mitochondria that are packed away inside of the muscle cell. And they're packed away in this form of mitochondria that's called a reticulum. We also have in there um, a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So smooth ER, which shouldn't really surprise us because we should expect smooth endoplasmic reticulum to be present. However, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that's present in muscle cell is going to be a specialized form of endoplasmic reticulum specific for muscles. We call this specialized endoplasmic reticulum a sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, the sarcoplasmic reticulum in the muscle is going to contain two components. In those two components, one is going to be called the terminal cisternae. And really, this, this term here, you should think of cistern, which is sort of vase-like. That's a terrible cistern, but there's my cistern. So that's why this was named 
the cistern because it was this tube-like or vase-like structure that extended from the uh, from the openings to the T-tubules into the mitochondria alongside those T-tubules. So here's that T-tubule, the transverse tubule, and then right alongside of it in red here, we have these column-like structures that basically run parallel alongside of the terminal cistern, or I'm sorry, the um, uh, T-tubules. So this is a good, really good representation. Yellow is the T-tubule, and then in red, running on either side there, is the terminal cisterna of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, notice that you have kind of terminal cisterna and transverse tubule sandwiched together. So one side, you got the terminal cisterna, and then you got the T-tubule, and then you got the other side, the cisterna on the other side. Collectively, those three objects, the two cisterna and then the T-tubule, are called the triad because there's three of them together. And then extending from the terminal cisterna, and what you see represented here really well, is the network of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the cisterna is going to interact with the T-tubule, which remember is that invagination or that extension of the membrane. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to be inside of the cell, inside of the membrane, but in very close physical contact to those T-tubule extensions. So the terminal cisternae and the T-tubules They interface or they interact. So they interface or they interact. And they interface and they interact as the triad. So they just form this structure that we're going to refer to as the triad. And really what it is, and you can see it in this figure, um, right here in this portion of the figure, you can see that we actually wrap around these other little protonaceous structures here, those things that we're going to identify here relatively soon as the myofibrils. So they wrap around the myofibrils, kind of a sandwiched rim. sandwiched ring around the myofibrils. Now because of this interface or this interaction between the terminal cisterna and the T-tubules, anything that happens in the T-tubule, say a signaling event, is actually going to be able to be passed. The signal can pass from the T-tubules to the sarcoplasmic reticulum through that triad uh, with the terminal cisterna. So signal to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is actually going to be a storage depot for calcium. And so whenever we have a signal that gets passed along the membrane down the T-tubule into that interaction with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the sarcoplasmic reticulum's membrane, because remember this is a membrane-bound organelle, so it also has a plasma membrane. We're just simply going to refer to it as the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it's going to become permeable to calcium. And there's a bunch of calcium stored inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So let's think about this a little bit. We can kind of think ahead about some of the physiology that might be coming. I'm saying that the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane is going to become permeable to calcium. What should we expect to find in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to help facilitate this change in permeability? This is a membrane that's going to become permeable to something. It's going to become permeable to calcium. 
how do membranes become permeable? What what accounts for the permeability of a membrane? Okay, so we're getting in the right direction. It's not going to be a pump because it's really high inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, really low in the intracellular fluid. So if it's not a pump, it's going to use a concentration gradient, so we're going to call it a... I know you know this because we talked about it in 107. You should know this team. Show us you do and you. Actually, all of you should really know it. <laughs> from high concentration to low concentration through a membrane, how is the calcium going through the membrane at a specific point in time and doesn't always cross the membrane at all? Okay, it's a selectively permeable membrane. So, what defines the selective nature of the membrane? Gates. 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 Yes! <laughs> 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 totally, totally like an overreaction. Because it was like, that just took two minutes and it should have taken two seconds. So, thinking ahead, if it's becoming permeable, we're probably going to have calcium channels, gated calcium channels. And I've just told you that it's a signal that's going to stimulate this. So, what kind of gated calcium channels? It's going to be a voltage gated channel. It's a voltage gated calcium channel. Calcium, or the, the channel opens in response to the signal that comes in down the membrane, down the T2 wheel. Calcium begins to flood into the cell. What's happening to the inside of the cell? Concentration of calcium is going way, way up. Do you think that we're maybe going to see calcium again as we go through the process of muscle contraction? The answer is yes. So that calcium floods the cell, and it's doing it through a voltage-gated calcium channel that's found in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. How many of you remember that now? Okay. <laughs> we definitely talked about that with the membranes earlier this semester. All right, so the next major structure, and I'm going to pull this out and we're going to talk about it separately from all the other organelle and things that we find inside the cell, is going to be the myofilaments. And the reason I'm pulling this out is because these are crucial to function of muscle cells, muscle contraction in particular. So this is what it's going to look like in the three-dimensional structure. Each of these is what's called a myofibril, and packed in that myofibril we have these things called myofilaments. Now you can't see the myofilaments or they haven't pulled the myofilaments out in that picture, but between this picture and this picture, this structure here, this whole structure here, is this whole structure right here. Okay, everybody see where, where we're going here? So if you get deeper and deeper in there, hopefully you're noticing that there are myofibrils. You also can see, what's this right here? This red network. It's close. It's what interacts with sarcoplasmic reticulum. Oh, the T2. T2 wheel, that's the invagination of the membrane. And then here in yellow is the network of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so we've got a good idea what's going on here now. Mitochondria packed away wherever they can fit. Notice that at the very end of this, I don't know, every time I see this, it looks like summer sausage. So at the end of the summer sausage here, you can see that <laughs> there are small little threads that they've kind of like pulled out. Those are the myofilaments. They are proteins. One of them is myosin. It's just simply a protein called myosin. The other one is actin. It's just simply a protein they call actin. Actin and myosin are going to be responsible for the shortening of the muscle. So these have to be organized in such a way that they can facilitate shortening. That's what you see down here on the bottom. This whole structure here is called a sarcomere. And it accounts for the striations that we see in histological sections. Striations where the alternating light and dark bands. Notice that if I were to pass light through this sarcomere here, 
there's not a lot of protein here. There's not a lot of protein here. And so I'm going to find some areas of light. And then there's a lot of protein here. I'm going to find areas of dark. So that's the molecular description or molecular reason for those light and dark bands that we see on our muscle sample in, in histological section. OK, so mild filaments. These are going to be threads of proteins. And they're contained in this much larger structure here called a myofibril. And then what do we call the whole cell? Muscle fiber, or it could also be referred to as a myofiber. So you have the whole thing. I'm trying to get you guys to a point where you are beginning to realize, OK, there's some very similar sounding words, but they mean something very, very different. The whole cell, myofiber or muscle fiber. Inside this organization of many, many protein threads, myofibril. And then the tiny little filaments that are packed together in the myofibril are the myofibril. Myofilaments. One of the ways you can remember this monofilament fishing line is a small little tiny thread. So the mono, the myofilaments are like the monofilament. So myofilaments are threads of protein and they're organized into the myofibrils. The myofibrils are organized into the myofiber, which is the muscle cell itself. So just to repeat myself here a little bit, the threads are myofilaments. So the threads are the myofilaments. And what we're going to find is that there are three types of myofilaments that we find inside of a myofibril. So three types figures, 11.3 through 11.5 are some good references for the stuff I'm about to go over right now. So one of the types is just simply going to be called the thick filaments. Now, what do you think is going to be one of the most distinguishing features of the thick filament? It's probably going to be the thickest of the filaments. Don't make this too hard. <laughs> okay, so the thick filament is made up of a protein called myosin. So this protein, myosin, has a very distinct shape. It actually looks like a two-headed golf club. So here's the shaft of the club, and then it has the two club heads. Okay. Now, those club heads eventually, what we're going to realize or come to learn is that those can flex. Now, you can probably can kind of see where this is going. So, if I grab on the, if I grab onto his arm, I can flex it and I'm pulling him towards it. Right? So, this tiny little molecular movement of flexing the head of the myosin is what's actually going to facilitate moving the ends of the muscle cell together. And we would call that contraction. Okay, so the protein is myosin. So let's talk a little bit more about this myosin molecule. So the myosin molecule. Now when we look at the myosin molecule, up here it's really easy to see that there's two different parts. One's in red and one is in blue. I'll show what I should have done. One is in blue and one is in brown. Everybody. One is in red, one is in blue. The dress is white and well. So why red and blue? Well, because they represent two types of myosin that are found in, in form the single molecule. So two myosin types form the signal molecule. 
the single myosin molecule. The red is called the tail, and then the blue is called the head. So we, that's supposed to say structure. So red tail, and then the blue is the head. Now, the tails of many molecules, which is what you can see down here in this figure, they basically lay next to each other, and the heads protrude from this big, long filament that we're building. So many molecules associate together. And when we put them together in this form, notice that we have basically three unique uh, um, sections of this whole thick filament. So this is the individual myosin molecule. Then we associate many of them together, and it's the thick filament. Okay. So the filament is going to consist of three sections. The filament is going to consist of three different sections. And I'm going to try to, I'm, let me just show you where they are. Obviously, section one here, section two is right here, and then this is my third section. And you may think, oh, well, the sections one and three look very similar, but actually they're not. And if you look at the way the head points, they actually point in different directions. So one part of the thick filament, the heads point towards the right. We have a center section here that's called the bare zone. Not the animal, but like not containing the head. So no heads. And then last, we have the heads pointing to the left, so the opposite, opposite orientation. What is the zone? It's the bear zone. There are no heads in the bear zone. Okay, so either we have them pointing to the right, we have them pointing to the left, or there's no heads at all. So the, heads pointing towards the, the heads are actually pointing away from the bear zone. And the reason that is, they're going to flex inward. So if I'm on this side here, if I'm on the, I mean, is that your, so you're looking at it as your, that's your right side, right? Left side. Sorry. If I'm on the left side, I'm going to pull on something like this. And you can see that I, if I had a rope attached to the wall there, I'd pull the wall towards me. Okay, so that's one of our filaments, the thick filament. And you're going to see where this comes in. I'm going to kind of introduce each of these individually, and then we're going to put them together. Next is going to be the thin filament or the thin filaments. This is made up of a protein called actin. There's also going to be a couple other proteins here as well, but the main one is actin. So thin filament, what's going to be uh, unique about this in terms of thickness and thinness? It's going to be our thins. Consists of actin, which is the white circles here. And they actually look very globular like this. They're a globular protein. But they can be strung together. So you have individual globs, and then you have longer fibers when the globs get all put together. So we take actin and we can actually describe it in those terms. We could call the globular actin G actin, where the G stands for globular. 
these are just simply the individual globs or beads of that particular atom molecule. The other type is going to be F or fibrous actin. And rather than being individual beads, this is a chain of individual beads strung together. Now, if I were to draw and kind of blow up an individual actin molecule. So what would I call that? That would be G actin. In all reality, what you're going to find in there is you have things like helices and loops and other helices, right? You have the three-dimensional shape of the protein, the tertiary structure, kind of all folded up together. One of those structures, uh, or, or some of the structures on there, are going to create this little pocket. Here's my little pocket. That little pocket's going to be referred to as the active site. The active site is the point on the actin molecule where the head of the myosin molecule, molecule can actually bind. Okay, so you kind of see what's going on here? Myosin is going to flex and interact with actin and is going to pull on that actin fiber and is going to pull on that thin filament. So we got like a tiny little molecular tug of war going on to cause muscles to contract. So G actin <clears throat> the G actin molecules have that active site, which is going to bind. To the head of myosin. I guess I could even put in here head of. So binds head of myosin. Now, the thick filament is made up of myosin, and really myosin is the only protein that we're aware of that is in that thick filament. The thin filament is not just actin. Primarily it's actin, but there's going to be a couple other proteins as well. And these proteins are going to actually be regulatory. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a, another piece of foreshadowing here. When the actin active site is exposed, myosin is going to bind and it's going to cause the muscle to contract. That's not advantageous because what if we don't want to contract the muscle? What if I just want to stand here loose and nice and calm and relaxed and I don't want to expend a whole lot of energy? I don't want the muscle to go through contraction. I don't want to. I want it to just stay. In an uncontracted form. Yeah, when you're sleeping, I guess, would be a good one. Or when you're just sitting here listening to me talk. Or when you're trying to feed yourself with a fork, you don't want your legs like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we want to regulate when that interaction between myosin and actin can actually occur. So we're also, with the thin film, going to have a couple regulatory or accessory proteins. One of those is going to be tropomyosin, and tropomyosin is going to come in two different states, a relaxed state and then an energized state. The relaxed state, tropomyosin is going to sit over the active sites of actin. So maybe I'll draw out a couple globular actin molecules. Here's my active sites. You can see tropomyosin here in the red. Tropomyosin would sit right over there, and it would block the myosin from actually being able to make contact with the active site. So it covers the outside? It covers that. It just sits over it. Mm -hmm. It would be... Um, I don't know, like if uh, I wanted to touch the floor right now, I couldn't touch it here because it's blocked by the floor. So I have to move that out of the way. I have to energize it somehow. What does that say? Covers the actin 
active sites. Now in terms of numbers here, one tropomyosin molecule will sit across and cover or block six to seven active sites. So these are kind of thin fiber-like, fiber thread-like proteins that set over those active sites. And I've already mentioned, but just so you have it in your notes, what we're blocking <clears throat> is the interaction that can occur with myosin. So it blocks myosin binding. Now there's one more molecule here, and it is in green. It's a little green globular protein in that picture. It's not really green in real life. Actually, I guess I can't really make that statement. I don't know what call it is. But I know that it's called troponin. So tro well, troponin and tropomyosin are going to interact together. <clears throat> In all reality, troponin is actually a protein complex. And it's associated physically with tropomyosin. It's going to be associated with tropomyosin. Now, what did I say we were going to see again? What was going to come back? Troponin has a binding site for calcium. So troponin binds calcium, and this happens during a physiological phenomenon in muscle known as excitation. So when we excite a muscle cell, what happens to calcium concentration in the intracellular fluid of the cell? It goes up. Calcium levels begin to increase in the cell, and they interact with troponin. Now, what happens to proteins when we bind a protein with something else? Changes form. Okay, it changes form and it changes function. Or we could say it changes shape and it changes function. Shape and form are synonyms. If I take calcium and I bind it troponin to troponin, the troponin is going to change its shape. When troponin changes its shape, it's physically associated with tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is also going to change its shape. What do you think that shape change is, change is going to result in? What was tropomyosin doing? Blocking the active site of actin. I'm now changing the shape. It's not going to block it anymore. So calcium rushes into the cell during this physiological phenomenon known as excitation. Calcium interacts with troponin. Troponin changes its shape, tropomyosin changes its shape. And it moves tropomyosin from the active site. Now, active site is exposed, head of myosin grabs on to tropomyosin. Add a little bit of ATP. That's enough energy to make that thing contract and pull on the thin filament. The thin filament is now going to be pulled on like a tug of war. I'm going to give you another little foreshadowing here. The thin filament eventually is going to be attached to the two ends of the cell. And when the thin filaments get pulled on, they pull on the end of the cell, causing that cell to shrink. So the tropomyosin changes form, right? Mm -hmm. But like it was covering six to seven active sites. 
So when it changes, it doesn't like disappear. So how are those? It doesn't. Um, that's a great question, Paige. So let's take a look at that. Let's draw a little bit more detail here. Can you see that? <laughs> you see it enough to know that that's in one of the circles represented. Yeah. Active. Okay, and what is acting going to have on them? Active. Okay, active sites. And let's draw one more right here. So now I have six. What's that? Tropomyosin. And what's that? Troponin. Okay, now, um, calcium levels increase, and we have an interaction between the troponin and calcium. So the next picture that I would draw here, I would have all of my all of my actin. Now calcium is interacting with troponin. Troponin and tropomyosin are physically associated. Calcium binds to troponin. Troponin is a protein. Whenever we bind a protein, we change. And the shape change. It's going to kind of bow, bow out okay. and move away from so those active sites. It doesn't necessarily like change. Like I was, I guess I was thinking like it became like a circle, but it doesn't necessarily. Like, it just kind of like bent. Yeah, but that's still changing shape. Yeah, so I know. It's I'm just, the end of the, the G um, I, I, I'm not really too sure exactly how tro tropomyosin sort of sits in the groove, which is what you see here, and then it sort of moves, moves away, bends away. So those active sites are now um, exposed. By the way, troponin would still be on there. Now we can't really see it too well anymore. So troponin's still on there, but it's changed its shape and it's pulled away. Physically moving and exposing those axes. So the, the shape too, not yeah, and the, the shape that it's changing is to cause it to pull on the okay. on the tropomyosin. Okay. Now these are really great questions, and this is a really sufficient answer. I'm guessing that there's probably a lot more of biophysics that I don't really understand. To be totally honest. On exactly what happens. We know that the active sites are exposed because of that change in shape. What actually causes the change in shape? I'm not really too sure. Like we can look at enzymes and we know that enzymes they may stress a bond to cause that bond to break, and that's how it works. As far as changing the shape of the tropomyosin, it changes its shape biophysically from a physical mechanical perspective. I'm not really too sure how it how it actually happens. Okay. I'm not going to expect you to know that. Like it allows for all of the, that it was kind of sort of like over to be able to be reached by the. Mind. Yeah, because really what's going to ultimately happen here, let me try to bring in a different color. Um, what do you, you think you'll be able to see hot pink? I'll, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> Is that hot enough? A hot enough pink? <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. That's so myosin's going to be in here like this. Now it moves out of the way. So it moves out of the way. It gets out of the way so that myosin. Yeah. All right. Um, when the triple myosin bends out, does that not also move the myosin out of the way too? Because there's not like kind of kind of. Like the, it's not. It's not attached to the myosin at all. The the. If I were to. Great questions. <laughs> we still have that stupid pink color, don't we? So. If I were to draw this out, 
And we're, we were actually going to do this, but you're kind of getting ahead a little bit, which is all right. Not, no big deal. You already sort of seen a, a drawing that looks similar to this. That guy right there. Maybe this is all bringing it back and you're kind of seeing how this all works out. These are the thin filaments, actin, troponin, tropomyosin. These are the thick filaments with our little tiny heads. They'd all be sticking out here. And you got to kind of think of this in three dimensions, right? So it's not just like heads on top. There's heads coming out the side as well, all the way around that circular structure. And the thin filaments are all the way around in a cir circular structure, right? It's three-dimensional, and that's kind of what you're seeing here. So if we did a cross-section through there, you would have the thick filament with a bunch of thin filaments around it, and those heads would be all sticking out like this down the length of that structure. And tropomyosin and troponin and move out of the way, act and exposed, and then the head can interact with the actin filament. And now this begins to pull, and what happens to this? It comes this way. And then this side comes this way. Now this structure here, which is called the sarcomere, it's really, really small. We're talking about measurements in the nanometers. And so I'm going to stack up literally hundreds of thousands of these down the length of the muscle cell. And each of them is going to move. And we're going to go from, and I don't even, you know, to be perfectly honest, I'm not even totally sure. I don't even know if I have a picture here or not. But, well, here you have, they're measuring this in, in angstroms which is one one thousandth of a nanometer. So that gives you kind of a reference. This is what it looks like in histological section. This is another representation. This is sort of what I've been trying to relate here. So this to this is the sarcomere, what I've drawn up there. And you're going to move Z line to Z line during a contraction. And as they contract, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. But it's kind of like, well, and, and <clears throat> I guess before I say that, it's a tiny little contraction, but there's a bunch of them all in a row. And it would kind of be like if everybody stood up right now and we all kind of grabbed hands and I held onto the wall here and we were in a big hallway or something like that. And everybody moved one inch. The, very per the person at the very opposite end away from the anchor, how much would they move? If there's 25 of us, they'd move two feet. So we can move very little on our own, but make huge movements collectively. Now we're talking about not 25 individual sarcomeres lined up, but hundreds of thousands of sarcomeres moving each a nanometer or something like that. And so you can get that huge change in contraction. So it's like a domino it's sort of like a domino effect, but it's more like just kind of everybody pulls just a little bit. And collectively added all together, you can move a muscle of great distance. Um, let's take a little break. We're going to come back and we're going to kind of go through everything that I just talked through. Hopefully this is making some sense and you're beginning to see how muscles contract. We still have to talk about how do we initially get calcium into the cell, and we have to talk about how we supply ATP to the sarcomere. I want to flesh out the sarcomere a little bit.